Will you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for the scriptures. Jeremiah said that your words were found, and he ate them, and they became to him the joy, the delight of his heart. Father, may we take joy in your word. May they delight our heart this morning as we study them, as we take them home with us, as we apply them, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, <clears throat> Adley and Cooley aren't alone. Um, everybody's moving around in the sanctuary this morning. People are sitting in other people's seats. Um, <laughs> how are we supposed to find anybody when you do that? Um, thank you for sharing your pew with other people. That's always, <laughs> that's always good. <clears throat> And Ray, that was an interesting way to do the hymn this morning. Um, my mentor used to do that all the time, but it was always with the last hymn, we'll sing the first and the last verses because he was ensuring that we had a one hour service. And so he's gonna cut a couple of verses out of the hymn. And I went to lunch after that happened one time with him and his wife, and she turned to him and said, Dick, Next time, give us pages one, three, and five of your sermon and let us sing our songs all the way through. That's not a good idea. <laughs> good morning, welcome. So, uh, a book collector uh, ran into a friend of his, and the friend said to him, you know, I just threw away a dusty old Bible in a beaten up old box. It was Guten something or other. You mean Gutenberg? Yeah, that, that was it. Do you know that that was one of the first books that was ever printed? That one just went on the market or to auction, and it sold for $5.4 million. Well, yeah, but this one wouldn't have sold for anything. Some guy named Martin Luther scribbled in all the margins. <laughs> Martin Luther's love of the scriptures preceded him. In 1516, in October of 1516, he began to lecture on the book of Galatians. Galatians and Romans are the two books in the New Testament that fueled the uh, Protestant Reformation and why so many Protestant Presbyterian Reformed churches are St. Paul's. I came here from York, Pennsylvania, and we had 34 St. Paul's. And so you couldn't call your church St. Paul's. We were Wolf's Church, and so it was named after the guy that gave the land for the church, or St. Paul's Stover's Town. It's named after the town that it was in in order to keep all the St. Paul's straight. Luther loved Paul, and he particularly loved the letter of Galatians. In fact, at one point he called it My Katie. Katie was his wife, and it was a double compliment. He loved his wife with his whole heart, and he also loved the book of Galatians. It is Paul's testament to Christian liberty, testament to Christian freedom. And as he was lecturing it on, it, on it in 1516 into the spring of 1517, the church was undergoing a revolution, and uh, his opponent, Eck, was out um, selling indulgences. And so uh, Luther had a problem with that, and he nailed his 95 theses to the wall of the, or to the door at the church in Wittenberg, October 31st, 1517, uh, fueled largely because of his lecturing and his study of the book of Galatians. In 1519, he lectured on it some more, and those lectures became a commentary. And in the commentary to Galatians, he writes, Dear Sirs, I was so stupid and I was so um, dumb that I was comparing what I was reading in God's Word to the words of the Pope and to the writings of the councils. And, you know, woe is me, I'm so dumb that I believe the Scriptures. When it comes to... The, the word of man versus the word of God, Luther defaulted to the word of God. And it was typical of Luther. He would understate some things and he would be really sarcastic with other things. Um, I like Luther because um, he was an earthy guy. And so he spoke in earthy terms and in earthy ways. Now, as we begin to look at the book of Galatians, if you brought your Bibles, chapter 3, beginning at verse 23. We need to be reminded that the scriptures are inspired, but the chapter breaks and the verses are not. Um, 
Now, we will all acknowledge that it's much easier to find John 3.16 when we have chapters and verses than it is to try to find God so loved the world somewhere in John's gospel. So they're helpful in that regard. But they're not helpful in another regard, that sometimes they were placed in an arbitrary way, and they're not always helpful. Paul is in the midst of a sustained argument in the book of Galatians. Um, but the people that put in the verses and the chapters didn't follow that. A guy named Nathan, a rabbi, in um, 1448, he divided the Old Testament up into chapters and verses. And then Stephen Langton, in 1227, divided the New Testament into chapters. He was an Archbishop of Canterbury. And then a few years later, well, and then in 13... Uh, 1382, the Wycliffe Bible followed these chapter breaks by Nathan and by Stephen Langton. And then in 1555, um, a guy named Robert Etienne divided the verses in the New Testament. But if you look at the way that they're divided, sometimes they interrupt a good argument that the writer is making that those breaks don't exist in the original. Those breaks weren't part of the way that Paul wrote his letter or the other writers. And so sometimes they get it wrong. And I think this is one of these places where they get it wrong. Um, there's a chapter break between chapters 3 and 4, and it doesn't really belong there because it's a part of an e extended argument. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Paul is laying out kind of his theology of Christian liberty. And so here are the points that he's trying to make, that our acceptance with God, please don't ever in my presence tell me how you accepted Christ. You did no such thing. Christ accepted you. Our acceptance with God and our relationship with God is on the basis of faith. And that it is inclusive of all different kinds of people, people that we would be shocked to find that are included in this acceptance and relationship with God. And that that relationship is not built upon or encouraged or uh, improved by our keeping of the law. That's the point that Paul is trying to make on our behalf. Um, there's plenty of seats up here in the front. I know the ushers. So, so Paul is trying to make those simple points. It's by faith that it's inclusive of all different kinds of people, that um, it is not improved by the keeping of the law. And so what we have here are two of Paul's numerous points that he's trying to get across about Christian liberty. And he uses um, ideas or experiences from daily life in order to make that point. So if you're looking at Galatians, bless you, Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. And that word is pedagogos, and so some believe that it's the law was our teacher. It can be understood in two different ways, positively and negatively. Positively, the law, the law was our teacher, and it gave us boundaries. It put up fences. The law acted as a guardrail to keep us from running off into a ditch. But that's not the way that Paul means it. The other way that that could be meant is that that word pedagogos in the New Testament was the disciplinarian. A rich Roman family had a male slave whose job it was to take the children to school and bring them home again, and they did that with a rod or with a switch in their hands to ensure that the children behaved themselves going to school and coming home from school. And so it's better a disciplinarian uh, rather than a, uh, than a, um, a teacher. Um, yes, that's a form of instruction. Um, who likes to get spanked? Not very many of us. The other word for teacher is didaskalos, didactic, and that is a person that encourages learning, that, that teaches in a gentle way, um, but that's not the word that Paul uses. And it's not intended as a guardrail, but Paul says, no, you're, this, this person, your disciplinarian, is really your jailer. And he kept you held captive. And Paul is comparing the law to the jailer. So we are subject to the Old Testament law up to a certain point, 
And then he's going to explain that in chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Notice in verse 2 of chapter 4, but he is under guardians and managers until that day. So the first illustration from life is this teacher, pedagogos. Now the ancient world, they understood that that was the disciplinarian, not the teacher. And now he's comparing them to a trustee or to a manager. That a child growing up in a household is little more than a slave until they reach the age of majority. And they are different than a slave in that the inheritance, whatever the assets of the family are, it's going to be theirs, particularly the oldest son. So Paul talks about sonship. Now, look at the title of the sermon. It's Children of God. We need to understand that we're talking about a patriarchal culture in an ancient time and that the firstborn male was the one who got the titles and the lands and the inheritances. Uh, primogenitor, that's just the way that it worked. Paul isn't giving approval of that system. Paul is simply saying that everybody understands that that's how it works and so he's using how it works as an illustration. So the son is entitled to the inheritance but he cannot receive the inheritance until he reaches the age of majority or until his father passes away or until his father has stipulated that in the fullness of time, that at the appropriate time, um, that they would receive the inheritance. I have a friend who's a millionaire and he and his wife are struggling. They have two kids and he's got lots and lots of money and he's wrestling with, do I give my children millions of dollars in inheritance when they're 18? Do I do it when they're 21? Do I wait until they're 35 um, so that they have to figure out how to live on their own and work in the world and rather than that they be trust fund babies and go out and squander the, the wealth that I have accrued? And he's wrestling hard with what to do about that. And that's what Paul is talking about here uh, in chapter 4. So we are under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. Now in the fullness of time, the date came. The Father sent the Son. And the Son lived under the law. Now he was obedient to the law, and we are not. He kept the law, and we cannot. And so by doing those things, he has fulfilled the requirements to receive the inheritance. And now we are sons of God, male and female. We are sons of God. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. The day has arrived. We've reached our majority. And we are to live into our identity our position as the sons, the son of the household, and that we receive all of the benefits and we are no longer under a tutor, we are no longer under a disciplinarian, we are no longer under a teacher. That's the function of the law in the Old Testament, but we have been released from captivity to the law. The law is not bad, but we're released from captivity to the law to live into our identity. Anybody notice in the news last week that Winnie Cooper became a Christian? Anybody know who Winnie Cooper is? The Wonder Years. And it was Kevin's little girlfriend, who's now 47 years old. What? Little Winnie Cooper is 47? And Winnie Cooper was given a Bible, and she became a Christian. I want to read to you her testimony, because this is what Paul wants us to understand. We put ourselves back under the law. We make New Year's resolutions. We gum up our spiritual lives with menial spiritual tasks and laws about how many times we're going to read the Bible in a day and how many books of the Bible we're going to read this year. Or, and, and doing those things is good. Those are not bad things to do. But we are not under law. We are under grace. We do it because we're excited about it. We don't do it because we have to. I have to have my quiet time this morning. That's, that's not the way to approach it. And so here's Danica McKellar's testimony. She was Winnie Cooper. It's been like a revolution in my life. It's been a revelation in my life. Candice Bure gave me this Bible, and I read it all the time. I love it so much. And I go to church now, and I just, I just talk to Jesus all the time, every day. And it's unbelievable. And I just want to thank her for that publicly. 
I can tell you that I'm experiencing a relationship with God and Jesus that I never had before. And it, it feels miraculous. I want people to feel the joy that I have found this year. I want people to feel that, and I want them not to feel alone. I want them to feel the Holy Spirit with them. I want them to feel the support and love and comfort. And that's what it's supposed to be. That's our, supposed to be our experience. Remember that John wrote to, or Jesus spoke to the church in the book of Revelation, you've lost your first love. That we have gummed up our spiritual lives by placing ourselves back under rules and laws and ceremonies and trying to gut out the spiritual life when we should be like a brand new Christian for whom it's all new and everything is exciting. Larry Norman's got a great line in his song, each day is different and life is a thrill and I know that tomorrow will be better still. That sounds like Danica McKellar. She is so excited about Jesus and so excited about her faith and she just can't help herself. She bubbles up and bubbles over and she hasn't been around the faith long enough to let people gum it up with all kinds of rules and requirements and New Year's resolutions and, and checklists and spiritual activities and tasks that they must be completed before you can do anything. And that's what Paul is talking about, that this, this uh, pedagogos, this disciplinarian is beating us down, but it's self-inflicted. That in Christ, the day of the fulfillment, the day of majority has arrived, and our identity as sons and daughters of God has come in its fullness, and we are no longer subject to captivity, but that we are free in Christ. If you've got your Bibles, turn to 5.1. Do not be subject again to a yoke of bondage. It is for freedom that Christ set you free. And so many Christians go through life with a scowl and beaten down and, oh, I'm so excited to be a Christian. Woo! Woo! And what kind of witness is that? And where is the joy of your life in Christ? We need to be like Danica McKellar. And what does she say? How has she grown? She prays. Yeah, we should pray. But, but it shouldn't be about a bunch of rules or I'm going to pray for... 16.4 seconds this day, and then tomorrow 17.4, and, and, and make all these rules about our prayer. She just, she gets out of bed, thank you Jesus for today, and she goes and makes coffee and says, thank you Jesus, I love coffee, and it tastes so good, and it gives me a morning buzz, and, 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 and she just, you know, it, she just overflows with, and she prays to him all day long. I hate the movie. The movie's terrible. Um, Lady Hawk. It's an awful movie. Don't waste your time watching it. But there's a character played by Matthew Broderick, and he's a slave. And he runs throughout the movie with this rolling dialogue between him and God. Something good happens. Thank you, God. Something bad happens. God, where the heck are you? And why don't you show up? And, and it's wonderful. Because that's, Paul says, pray without ceasing. That's how we're supposed to live our lives, in running dialogue with God. That's what it means to pray without ceasing. And we pray for the good, and we pray for the bad, and we pray for the Orioles to win, and we pray for a parking space. All of that is good and wonderful, and that's how we're supposed to pray. Um, and so uh, you can write that down. That's a rule. Um, <laughs> But that's how we're supposed to pray. And then the other thing that Danica McKellar said is, and, and she gave me a Bible, and I read it every day. I, she reads it not because somebody told her she had to, and that it's become some onerous task or a chore that she must complete before she can go on with her day, but that God is speaking to her through his word, and that she is growing and learning all the time, and she's just beside herself with excitement. And then she lists a third thing, and Paul gives it to us here in uh, chapter 4, also in verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That we walk led by the spirit, not by a bunch of rules and regulations. Christianity is not moralism. So stop with all the goodness and kindness and all that nonsense and all those rules. That's not the faith. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus and we walk by the Spirit, not by the law. And he gives us his Spirit and he resides within us and it resonates with us like Danica McKellar. 
that he is Abba, he's my daddy, he's my father. And we understand our position and we understand our relationship and we walk in freedom and excitement and in joy because the thing that we've been waiting for is to be released from the captivity of the law from all the rules and the regulations and the ceremonies and all of the stuff that beats us down because we're not able to do those things. If we were, Jesus wouldn't have come. But he came in the fullness of time. And in the fullness of time, by his obedience and by, by his keeping of the law, we are now in the fullness of time and we've been released from it and we have received our inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed you, all y'all, with all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Anything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. That's what's been accomplished for you. And Paul wants us to walk in our identity as sons and daughters of God, that we've received our inheritance. We don't have to look forward to it. We don't have to wait for it anymore that we are in right relationship with God because, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf, and that he has brought all of these gifts to us. As we begin a new year, if you want to do New Year's resolutions, knock yourselves out. But let me encourage you to walk in the freedom of Christ. Receive the inheritance that's due to you as a son or a daughter of God, bought for you by Jesus Christ. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stop subjecting yourselves to yokes of bondage. That's a great message for the new year, and that's the message of Paul in this chapter this morning. Amen.